The Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Ott. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation Podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from World Tales by Idris Shah. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Gorgon's Head The Greek idea of the head of a gorgon, one look at which can turn one into stone, is so arresting as never to be forgotten when once heard. The myth of the adventures of Perseus, told by Kingsley in The Heroes, has all the elements of folk tales: the magical apparatus, the perilous voyage, the beautiful maiden, daughter of a king, the threat of death, and the killing of a monster all figure prominently. The legend of St. George has been seen as but a retelling of the killing of the monster and rescue of the maiden episodes from this narrative. According to early commentators, this theme is a portrayal of the victory of the Christian hero over evil, though later analysts saw it as a solar myth. More recently, a psychoanalytical explanation has been preferred, and no doubt reinterpretations will continue according to the opinions of the experts from time to time. Andrew Lang, the distinguished folklorist, reconstituted the myth in a fairy tale book from Apollodorus, Simonides and Pindar, as the terrible head, thus giving us an opportunity of comparing a version for popular consumption with the classical texts available in standard books. This may represent the first stage of popularization through which other literary presentations have gone in their transition into fireside telling. Once upon a time, there was a king whose only child was a girl. Now the king had been very anxious to have a son, or at least a grandson, to come after him, and he was told by a prophet that his own daughter's son should kill him. This news terrified him so much that he determined never to let his daughter be married, for he thought that it was better to have no grandson at all than to be killed by his grandson. He therefore called his workmen together and bade them dig a deep round hole in the earth, and then he had a prison of brass built in the hole, and then when it was finished he locked up his daughter. No man ever saw her, and she never saw even the fields and the sea, but only the sky and the sun, for there was a wide open window in the roof of the house of brass. So the princess would sit looking up at the sky and watching the clouds float across, and wondering whether she should ever get out of her prison. Now one day it seemed to her that the sky opened above her, and a great shower of shining gold fell through the window in the roof and lay glittering in her room. Not very long after, the princess had a baby, a little boy. But when the king heard of it, he was very angry and afraid, for now the child was born that should be his death. Yet cowardly as he was, he had not quite the heart to kill the princess and her baby outright, but he had them put in a huge brass-bound chest and thrust out to sea, so that they might either be drowned or starved or perhaps come to a country where they would be out of his way. So the princess and the baby floated and drifted in the chest on the sea all day and all night, but the baby was not afraid of the waves nor of the wind, for he did not know that they could hurt him, and he slept quite soundly. And the princess sang a song over him, and this was her song. Child, my child, how sound you sleep, though your mother's care is deep. You can lie with heart at rest in the narrow brass-bound chest. In the starless night and drear, you can sleep and never hear billows breaking and the cry of the night wind wandering by. In soft purple mantle sleeping with your little face on mine, hearing not your mother weeping and the breaking of the brine. 
Well, the daylight came at last, and the great chest was driven by the waves against the shore of an island. There it lay with the princess and her baby in it, till a man of that country came past, and saw it, and dragged it onto the beach, and when he had broken it open, behold, there was a beautiful lady and a little boy. So he took them home and was very kind to them, and brought up the boy till he was a young man. Now when the boy had come to his full strength, the king of that country fell in love with the mother and wanted to marry her, but he knew that she would never part from her boy. So he thought of a plan to get rid of the boy, and this was his plan. A great queen of a country not far off was going to be married, and this king said that all his subjects must bring him wedding presents to give her. And he made a feast to which he invited them all, and they all brought their presents. Some brought gold cups, and some brought necklaces of gold and amber, and some brought beautiful horses. But the boy had nothing, though he was the son of a princess, for his mother had nothing to give him. Then the rest of the company began to laugh at him, and the king said, If you have nothing else to give, at least you might go and fetch the terrible head. The boy was proud and spoke without thinking. Then I swear that I will bring the terrible head, if it may be brought by a living man. But of what head you speak, I know not. Then they told him that somewhere, a long way off, there dwelt three dreadful sisters, monstrous, ogrish women, with golden wings and claws of brass, and with serpents growing on their heads instead of hair. Now these women were so awful to look on that whoever saw them was at once turned into stone, and two of them could not be put to death, but the youngest, whose face was very beautiful, could be killed, and it was her head that the boy had promised to bring. You may imagine it was no easy adventure. When he had heard all this, he was pretty sorry that he had sworn to bring the terrible head, but he was determined to keep his oath. So he went out from the feast, where they all sat drinking and making merry, and he walked alone beside the sea in the dusk of the evening, at the place where the great chest, with himself and his mother in it, had been cast ashore. There he went and sat down on a rock, looking towards the sea and wondering how he should begin to fulfil his vow. Then he felt someone touch him on the shoulder, and he turned and saw a young man like a king's son, having with him a tall and beautiful lady, whose blue eyes shone like stars. They were taller than mortal men, and the young man had a staff in his hand with golden wings on it, and two golden serpents twisted around it, and he had wings on his cap and on his shoes. He spoke to the boy, and asked him why he was so unhappy, and the boy told him that he had sworn to bring the terrible head, and knew not how to begin to set about the adventure. Then the beautiful lady also spoke, and said that it was a foolish oath and hasty, but that it might be kept if a brave man had sworn it. Then the boy answered that he was not afraid, if only he knew the way. Then the lady said that to kill the dreadful woman with the golden wings and the brass claws and to cut off her head, he needed three things. First, a cap of darkness, which would make him invisible when he wore it. Next, a sword of sharpness, which would cleave iron with one blow. And last, the shoes of swiftness, with which he might fly in the air. The boy answered that he knew not where such things were to be procured, and that lacking them he could only try and fail. Then the young man, taking off his own shoes, said, First, you shall use these shoes till you have taken the terrible head, and then you must give them back to me. And with these shoes you will fly as fleet as a bird or a thought, over the land and over the waves of the sea, wherever the shoes know the way but there are ways which they do not know, roads beyond the borders of the world, and these roads you must travel. 
Now first you must go to the three grey sisters who live far off in the north, and are so very old that they have only one eye and one tooth among the three. You must creep up close to them, and as one passes the eye to the other you must seize it and refuse to give it up till they have told you the way to the three fairies of the garden. They will give you the cap of darkness and the sword of sharpness and show you how to wing beyond this world to the land of the terrible head. Then the beautiful lady said, Go forth at once, and do not return to say goodbye to your mother, for these things must be done quickly, and the shoes of swiftness themselves will carry you to the land of the three grey sisters, for they know the measure of that way. So the boy thanked her, and he fastened on the shoes of swiftness, and turned to say goodbye to the young man and the lady. But behold, they had vanished, he knew not how or where. Then he leaped in the air to try the shoes of swiftness, and they carried him more swiftly than the wind, over the warm blue sea, over the happy lands of the south, over the northern peoples who drank mare's milk and lived in great wagons, wandering after their flocks. Across the wide rivers where the wild fowl rose and fled before him, and over the plains in the cold north sea he went, over the fields of snow and the hills of ice, to a place where the world ends, and all water is frozen, and there are no men, nor beasts, nor any green grass. There, in a blue cave of the ice, he found the three grey sisters, the oldest of living things. Their hair was as white as snow, and their flesh of an icy blue, and they mumbled and nodded in a kind of dream, and their frozen breath hung around them like a cloud. Now the opening of the cave in the ice was narrow, and it was not easy to pass in without touching one of the grey sisters. But floating on the shoes of swiftness, the boy just managed to steal in, and waited till one of the sisters said to another, who had their one eye, Sister, what do you see? Do you see old times coming back? No, sister. Then give me the eye, for perhaps I can see farther than you. Then the first sister passed the eye to the second, but as the second groped for it, the boy took it cleverly out of her hand. Where is the eye, sister? said the second grey woman. You have taken it yourself, sister, said the first grey woman. Have you lost the eye, sister? Have you lost the eye? said the third grey sister. Shall we never find it again and see old times coming back? Then the boy slipped from behind them out of the cave into the air, and he laughed aloud. When the old women heard that laugh, they began to weep, for now they knew that a stranger had robbed them and that they could not help themselves. Their tears froze as they fell from the hollows where no eyes were and rattled on the icy ground of the cave. Then they began to implore the boy to give them their eye back again, and he could not help feeling sorry for them, they were so pitiful. But he said he would never give them the eye till they told him the way to the fairies of the garden. They wrung their hands miserably, for they guessed why he had come, and how he was going to try to win the terrible head. Now the three grey sisters were akin to the dreadful women, and it was hard for them to tell the boy the way. But at last they told him to keep always south, and with the land on his left and the sea on his right, till he reached the island of the fairies of the garden. Then he gave them back the eye, and they began to look out once more for the old times coming back again. The boy flew south between sea and land, keeping the land always on his left hand, till he saw a beautiful island crowned with flowering trees. There he alighted, and there he found the three fairies of the garden. They were like three very beautiful young women, dressed one in green, one in white, and one in red and they were singing and dancing around an apple tree with fruit of gold, and this was their song. 
The Song of the Western Fairies Round and round the apples of gold, round and round dance we. Thus do we dance from the days of old about the enchanted tree. Round and round and round we go. While the spring is green, or the stream shall flow, or the wind shall stir the sea, there is none may taste of the golden fruit till the golden new times come. Many a tree shall spring from shoot, many a blossom be withered at root, many a song be dumb. Broken and still shall be many a lute, or ever the new times come. Round and round the tree of gold, round and round dance we. So doth the great world spin from of old, summer and winter and fire and cold, song that is sung and tale that is told, even as we dance that fold and unfold round the stem of the fairy tree. These grave dancing fairies were very unlike the grey women, and they were glad to see the boy and treated him kindly. Then they asked him why he had come, and he told them how he was sent to find the sword of sharpness and the cap of darkness. And the fairies gave him these, and a wallet and a shield, and he belted the sword which had a diamond blade around his waist, and the cap they set on his head, and told him that now even they could not see him, though they were fairies. Then he took it off, and they each kissed him and wished him good fortune, and then they began again their eternal dance around the golden tree, for it is their business to guard it till the new times come, or till the world's ending. The boy put the cap on his head, and hung the wallet around his waist, and the shining shield on his shoulders, and he flew beyond the great river that lies coiled like a serpent around the whole world. And by the banks of that river, there he found the three terrible women, all asleep beneath a poplar tree, with the dead poplar leaves lying all about them. Their golden wings were folded, and their brass claws were crossed, and two of them slept with their hideous heads beneath their wings like birds, and the serpents in their hair writhed out from under the feathers of gold. But the youngest slept between her two sisters, and she lay on her back, with her beautiful sad face turned to the sky, and though she slept her eyes were wide open. If the boy had seen her, he would have been changed into stone by the terror and the pity of it, she was so awful. But he had thought of a plan for killing her without looking at her face. As soon as he caught sight of the three from far off, he took his shining shield from his shoulders and held it up like a mirror, so that he saw the dreadful women reflected in it and did not see the terrible head itself. Then he came nearer and nearer till he reckoned that he was within a sword stroke of the youngest, and he guessed where he should strike a back blow behind him. Then he drew the sword of sharpness and struck once, and the terrible head was cut from the shoulders of the creature, and the blood leaped out and struck him like a blow. But he thrust the terrible head into his wallet, and flew away without looking behind. The two dreadful sisters who were left wakened, and rose in the air like great birds, and though they could not see him because of his cap of darkness, they flew after him up the wind, following by the scent through the clouds like hounds hunting in a wood. They came so close that he could hear the clattering of their golden wings and their shrieks to each other, Here, here, no, there, this way he went, as they chased him. But the shoes of swiftness flew too fast for them, and at last their cries and the rattle of their wings died away as he crossed the great river that runs around the world. When the horrible creatures were far in the distance, and the boy found himself on the right side of the river, he flew straight eastward, seeking his own country. But as he looked down from the air, he saw a very strange sight, a beautiful girl chained to a stake at the high water mark of the sea. The girl was so frightened or so tired that she was only prevented from falling by the iron chain around her waist, and there she hung as if she were dead. The boy was very sorry for her, and flew down and stood beside her. 
When he spoke, she raised her head, but his voice only seemed to frighten her. Then he remembered that he was wearing the cap of darkness, and that she could only hear him, not see him. So he took it off, and there he stood before her, the handsomest young man she had ever seen in all her life, with short curly yellow hair and blue eyes and a laughing face. And he thought her the most beautiful girl in the world. With one blow of the sword of sharpness he cut the iron chain that bound her, and then he asked her why she was here, and why men treated her so cruelly. She told him that she was the daughter of the king of that country, and that she was tied there to be eaten by a monstrous beast out of the sea, for the beast came and devoured a girl every day. Now the lot had fallen on her, and as she was just saying this, a long, fierce head of a cruel sea creature rose out of the waves and snapped at her. But the beast had been too greedy and too hurried, so he missed his aim the first time. Before he could rise and bite again, the boy had whipped the terrible head out of his wallet and held it up. And when the sea beast leaped out once more, its eyes fell on the head, and instantly it was turned into a stone. And the stone beast is there on the sea coast to this day. Then the boy and the girl went to the palace of the king, her father, where everyone was weeping for her death. And they could hardly believe their eyes when they saw her come back well. And the king and queen made much of the boy, and could not contain themselves for delight when they found he wanted to marry their daughter. So the two were married with the most splendid rejoicings, and when they had passed some time at court they went home in a ship to the boy's own country. He could not carry his bride through the air, so he took the shoes of swiftness and the cap of darkness and the sword of sharpness up to a lonely place in the hills. There he left them, and there they were found by the man and woman who had met him at home beside the sea, and had helped him to start on his journey. When this had been done, the boy and his bride set forth for home, and landed at the harbour of his native land. But whom should he meet in the very street of the town but his own mother, flying for her life from the wicked king, who now wished to kill her, because he had found that she would never marry him. For if she had liked the king little before, she liked him far worse now that he had caused her son to disappear so suddenly. She did not know, of course, where the boy had gone, but thought the king had slain him secretly. So now she was running for her very life, and the wicked king was following her with a sword in his hand. Then behold, she ran into her son's very arms, but he had only time to kiss her and step in front of her when the king struck at him with his sword. The boy caught the blow on his shield and cried to the king, I swore to bring you the terrible head and see how I keep my oath. Then he drew forth the head from his wallet, and when the king's eyes fell on it, instantly he was turned to stone, just as he stood there with his sword lifted. Now all the people rejoiced, because the wicked king should rule them no longer, and they asked the boy to be their king, but he said no, he must take his mother home to her father's house. So the people chose for king the man who had been kind to the boy's mother when first she was cast on the island in the great chest. Presently the boy and his mother and his wife set sail for his mother's own country, from which she had been driven so unkindly. But on the way they stayed at the court of a king, and it happened that he was holding games and giving prizes to the best runners, boxers and quoit throwers. Then the boy would try his strength with the rest, but he threw the quoit so far that it went beyond what had ever been thrown before, and fell in the crowd, striking a man so that he died. Now this man was no other than the father of the boy's mother, who had fled away from his own kingdom for fear his grandson should find him and kill him after all. Thus he was destroyed by his own cowardice and by chance, and thus the prophecy was fulfilled. But the boy and his wife and his mother went back to the kingdom that was theirs, and lived long and happily after all their troubles.
The Brahmin's Wife and the Mongoose This story must be one of the most popular in history. It is found in a Chinese collection dated to 412 AD, reputed to originate from the era of the great Indian Emperor Ashoka, about 230 BC. It is still alive in the storyteller's repertoire in India and was for centuries a favourite tale in Europe. It is found in the Greek translation of the Eastern Book of Sindabad and also in Latin, almost a hundred years before it was claimed to be an historical incident in the life of the Welsh Prince Llewellyn and his faithful hound Gellert, a greyhound presented to him in 1205 AD. There is indeed a Welsh proverb, I am as sorry as the man who killed his greyhound. In some versions, the mongoose becomes a wolf, or a snake, or even an eagle. In France, where the event was also believed to have occurred as an historical fact, the dog was, in the Middle Ages, regarded as a miracle-working martyr, and sick children were taken to his reputed grave. In Persian, it is related as a Chinese tale, and it is also extant in Hebrew, Spanish and Syriac versions. In India, there flows a most holy river called the Ganges, named for the goddess Ganga, Hindu divinity of the rivers, near the ancient city of Banaras. Near this city was a town called Mithila, where there dwelt a poor man of the Brahmin faith and tradition called Vidyadhara. He had no children, and he and his wife greatly loved, instead of a son or daughter, a tame mongoose. For a long time the god Visvesvara and his wife Visalakshi observed this kindly pair, and so by divine power they blessed them with a son. The child and the mongoose were brought up together as twin brothers in the same cradle for the Brahmin believed that the gods had given them a child because of their good behaviour towards the animal. One day, in the morning, when the Brahmin had gone out to beg alms of the pious and charitable, and his wife was busy over her herb pots, a snake glided through a hole in the garden wall. The mongoose kept watch beside its young master as usual, and saw its ancient enemy. The snake came towards the cradle and hissed, fixing its glittering eyes upon the child. Without a moment's hesitation, the brave little animal attacked the snake, and a fierce fight ensued. Soon the venomous cobra was dead, torn to pieces by the faithful mongoose. Covered with blood, the mongoose ran to the child's mother with great excitement to show her what had been done. Oh, wretched mongoose, cried she following it to the room where the upturned cradle and blood-stained bed covering showed no sign of the child. You have in your dreadful jealousy killed my son, the light of my eyes! And with several strokes of the knife in her hand, she killed the creature. But crawling from a darkened corner of the room, the child laughed for joy, and the unhappy mother saw the mangled portions of the snake beside the cradle. The mongoose had paid for the kindness which the Brahmin and his wife had shown it with its life. The Magic Bag This tale, told by a Berber tribesman in Morocco, has been said to date from the time when Christian priests and monks were still being challenged by local magicians who would not readily accept the new religion. North Africa certainly was Christianized before the Islamic conquest, and there is no way of telling whether this is the reason. On the other hand, the tale appears in similar form, with some of the same elements, both in Germany, Brother Lustig, and in Italy, Brother Giovannone, in which the hero is a monk and the bag is a gift from St. Peter, who is eventually blackmailed into letting him into paradise with the threat of its use. In the Sicilian version, the monk actually imprisons death in the bag, preventing people from dying, as in the tale Occasion in this collection. 
There is a similarity, though not an identity, of this kind of tale with Central Asian ones, where people with unusual powers are able to combat the normal reward and punishment routine laid down by local religion. Some versions, as in the case of a version from Tuscany, have the hero suspending his own demise through trapping death. He is hence called Godfather Misery, because misery never ends. In the telling of the same tale from Venice, where he is called Beppo Pipetta, he gets into heaven by a trick. Refused admittance, he throws his cap in and then slips in and sits on it, because I am sitting on my own property, and on my own property I do not take anyone's orders. There was once a priest and a magician. The priest said, It is only through me that you will get to heaven. The magician said, Is there no other way to achieve seemingly impossible things? No, said the priest. We priests have the monopoly apart from some saints, but they are few and far between. As you know, they are almost all in the distant past. Now the magician had a magical bag, and it could swallow anything its owner wanted. The priest did not know that, but he was new in those parts, so that explained his confident manner. The magician said, If you have all the power, then you will not mind if I say to this bag, Swallow the priest. Not at all, said the priest, though it is a proof of your barbarian state, may your soul be saved. The magician took up his bag and said to it, Swallow the priest. The bag drew the priest into itself, and he was never seen again. Now the magician decided that there was no need to allow priests, and others for that matter, to have all the dealings with the invisible world. So he always put into the bag any priests or monks who would not accept his claim to equal rights of intervention in matters such as these. In the end, most of the priests concentrated on exhorting people to do good, while the magician used his bag to swallow people and things which were bad. Finally, a whole swarm of devils, voraciously hungry, because so much bad was disappearing without trace, tracked down the magician. He told the bag to swallow them, and it did. But they were too tough for it to digest. The time for the total dissolution of demons had not yet arrived. So the magician took the bag to a blacksmith. How much to hammer this bag completely flat, as slim as a knife blade? The smith said that he would do it for ten silver pieces. So he hammered day and night, but he could not get the bag flat. The demons, as is their habit, could always inflate themselves slightly after a blow had made them flat for a moment or two. You must have the devil in this bag, shouted the furious and baffled smith. Yes, indeed I have, said the magician. Giving the smith only one silver piece for his trouble, he opened the bag, and all the devils streamed out back to hell, feeling very battered. Now the magician carried on his life in much the same way, avoiding anything unpleasant by making it go into the magical bag, until it was nearly his time to die. He went to see a wise hermit about it. The hermit said, If you have not been honed by pleasant and unpleasant things, you may get neither to heaven nor to hell, and you may cease to exist. But that is what some people want anyway. When he died, the magician found himself at the gates of hell. Why am I here because I got rid of so much evil in my life? he asked the demon at the gate. The demon looked in his book. Because you spent so much time concentrating on bad things that you have a natural affinity for us. Come in, he said. The magician did not like the sound of this at all, so he said to the bag, which was over his shoulder, Swallow all this! In a twinkling of an eye, there was no hell to be seen. 
The magician made his way to heaven. At the gate he was stopped. I have to come in, he said. Why? said the angel on duty. Because hell has ceased to exist and there is no other place to go. I can get heaven into this bag in a twinkling of an eye, and you too if you don't let me in. And that, they say, is how he got into heaven. But there are some who say that the places he visited were not heaven or hell at all. But you just decide, as I have given you all the help I can, and it is nearly time for me to jump into my magical bag. This podcast is copyright 2018, the Idris Shah Foundation.